Today I'm learning about Napoleon's battle at Friedland. Okay, so we have different flags this time. <laughs> Man, these horses. <laughs> what? I have a feeling this is not gonna go well for the Russians. <laughs> So those of you who have been watching my videos and know that I like to use your comments to learn more about history and these various topics that we're exploring together, or at least that you're watching me explore because a lot of you probably already know all of this stuff. Now I do have a notebook that I've been keeping notes in, but I thought it would be more fun just for the sake of this video if we go back to my last video in this series on I Lao? That is how you say it, right? And just look at what you had to say about that video, answering my questions and so forth. Since my main purpose for doing these videos is to actually learn all of this stuff, I do refer back to my previous videos and I like to kind of build upon the knowledge that I get in each video. Now if you don't care about this part and you just want to go right to the reaction, I have started putting chapter markers in my videos so you can just click on the reaction mark and go straight to that. But I do enjoy these discussions that we have together in the comments and so I do want to use that to kind of lead into this video. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. Oh, I did ask what game the uh, graphics were coming from, and a lot of you guys said that the game is Total War Napoleon, so thanks for that. And I think you said a lot of the music also came from that. Uh, the yellow flag with the two-headed eagle is the flag of the Tsarist Russian Empire? Is that how you say that right there? Tsarist? Russian Empire. I don't know what that is actually. I'm assuming it's the precursor to the Soviet Union. Your interest in knowledge is commendable. Well, thank you, Conqueror Von Zapp. Appreciate it. I remember being surprised by some of your comments that the Germans actually used horses in World War II, and you guys said that a lot of horses were used behind the front lines and were not filmed. No wonder I haven't seen them. So Kieran Byrne says, it's a huge myth that the British only fought in the line in the Revolutionary War. Both sides mostly fought in pitched battles. The light infantry were the absolute elite of army along with the grenaders and guards and skirmished plenty. Okay, so that, I think I was correct when I said the European armies that did actually have skirmishers or light infantry before the Americans, but some of you guys made the point in here that the Americans kind of innovated a little bit and Europe took a little bit of that back. So the yellow flags are indeed Russian, their bird is the imperial, double-headed eagle. No wonder I couldn't find a single, I was looking for a single head and I didn't see it, so the double head, that's why I wasn't getting it. It harkens back to the old Eastern Roman Empire. You know what, I forgot that the Roman Empire was split between East and West actually. Someone I was DMing with on Instagram uh, also reminded me of that, so okay, a lot of comments about the, the yellow flag, so I appreciate that guys. Also the next video in the series is going in chronological order should be the Battle of Friedland. Well, here we are. Uh, Samo Zelik, I'm not sure how you say that name, recommends Kings and Generals for the Thirty Years War. Yeah, we're gonna get to the Thirty Years War because I'm gathering from all of your comments that the Thirty Years' War is crucial to understanding the Napoleonic Wars, and I know nothing about it. So Kurt Septon says in German the letter J is pronounced the English letter Y, so Jenna is pronounced Yenna. Yeah, I made the mistake by calling it Jenna in the last video. I have more channel recommendations of geography now. I've had a lot of recommendations for that. We're gonna have to get to that soon. Uh, Oversimplified's World War II. I have seen Oversimplified World War One and World War Two. We can watch them, but um, you're not going to get like a super authentic first time watching reaction from me. In the same regard, I have also seen The Fallen of World War Two. That one keeps getting recommended to me, and I just want to let you guys know that I have seen it. So again, we can watch it, but you're not going to get that super authentic reaction. We can watch it for discussion purposes, though, if you'd like to do that. Uh, Stuart Miller says, following from your British Empire theme, have a look at at the Zulu Wars in Africa. Yeah, I did a community post probably about a week, I don't know, a week ago, a week and a half ago, something like that, where I mentioned that Gettysburg was my favorite war movie, and then I asked you guys what your favorite one was, and there were a lot of people that mentioned Zulu, so can't tell you that I've seen it. Uh, Eric Marley says, these animals have learned something. Okay, looks like he's quoting something, maybe Napoleon. <laughs> I don't know. If you guys can explain that to me, let me know. Uh, Kofefe <laughs> says a few hundred meters was usually the distance between armies before they fought each other, so that's not too far, actually. Uh, Veleto? 
I, I'm sorry. I don't know how to say that. It says that there's a video about what happened to the Russian flag or something like that. Okay. I'll have to look that one up. Frederick says the French cavalry charge at Eilau was one of the biggest of all time. 10,000. Wow. That is a lot of horses and a lot of men. Deeks25 says that this is exactly how I think history should be studied. There's a high level view of the overall situation. Yes, I, I agree. I think video actually is one of the best ways to learn. Obviously, it's not the only way to learn. You should supplement it with things like books or other resources, but the advantage video gives you is that it really can bring history to life in a way that a book might not be able to. And it does kind of, these shorter videos kind of give you uh, an overall picture of things that you can then take that knowledge from the video and then read a book about it and I think understand the book better. Uh, Chris A says I want you to do reactions to Napoleon's marshals. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna get to Napoleon's marshals. Don't worry about that. Uh, 2000 VM says your approach to watching videos is so serious. Is this some kind of self-education? Yes, it is. It's exactly what this is. Ao Rum says Napoleon did take Moscow. Yeah, I got a lot of um, correction, let's say, on that point. Napoleon did take Moscow. For some reason, I confuse him not holding Moscow and taking, I guess, Russia as him not taking Moscow. So, okay, I guess he took Moscow but wasn't able to hold it. High Liger Bim Bam. That's a really interesting name. Uh, it says the effective artillery range was around a mile, well, not a mile. This is kilometers in Europe. 1 to 1.5 kilometers during that time. So, not too bad, I guess. Uh, Michael Berchinger says, please react to the Battle of Aspern Eslington in 1809. Well, we're gonna get to that. We're still in 1807 at this point, so. Uh, Fine Sin says, some people put in the effort to produce these videos for you just for you to make a video reacting to them. Well, yes, that is how reaction videos work. But you also have to remember that I am doing this to learn for myself, and I want to bring in other people who are also interested in this stuff to learn from as well. So while I do credit the original video, you can always find the links to them in the descriptions. There is a bigger purpose for me making these videos. You can agree or disagree with it. If you don't like it, then you know what? Don't have to watch. Uh, Chris D'Amato says, it's a great video, I'll tell you that, but when the title says American Reacts, I didn't expect her to be Jodie Foster. Great video. I've had a few people tell me that uh, I remind them of Jodie Foster, and I don't know a whole lot about her, actually. I've seen her in a couple of movies, I think, but, um, okay. Richard Chan asks, were you planning to watch some Orient-based history videos. Yes, I've done a few in Asia, but I would like to kind of do really the history of the world. Uh, I've been focusing more on European history just because that's where things have mostly led to so far, but I do intend to really kind of focus on the world at large on this channel, so we will be getting to things outside of Europe, and we will probably do some stuff on the U.S. too, because I'm not an expert in U.S history or affairs by any means. So, all right, so we're going to leave it there. Really appreciate your comments on that video. And again, on this one that we're going to watch, please leave comments as well, because I do learn a lot from them. All right. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the Battle of Friedland. I don't really know anything about this. I don't know what to expect. You know, Roger? Well, there we go. All right. So let's watch the Battle of Friedland. One week before Christmas, 1806, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte arrived in the Polish city of Warsaw, then part of Prussia. A year had passed since his great victory over the Austrians and Russians at Austerlitz, and two months since he'd hammered the Prussians at Jena. But Russia still had powerful forces in the field, the most important of which was the Russian First Army, commanded by General Bennigsen. Napoleon would not be master of Europe until it was defeated, and Russia and Prussia forced to make peace. But that winter, Napoleon's first attempt to trap Bennigsen near Potusk got bogged down in thick Polish mud. Okay, so we have different flags this time. <laughs> Um, what is, what is the one with, like, right here with the white and yellow and all of this stuff? I mean, obviously, these down here represent Napoleon's army, the French army, um, even though it's not the French flag. I guess it's just a graphic that they're using. Now we have, I'm, I'm, I think I see the eagle, the double-headed eagle still on this one, but the flag looks different. So did they change the flag at some point? The 
Russians withdrew to Bialystok. The French army, half-starved and frozen, was ordered into winter quarters. While in Warsaw, Napoleon began a famous affair with a young Polish noblewoman, Marie Walewska. In the late 18th century, the once mighty Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been swallowed up by its neighbours, Russia, Austria and Prussia, in a series of annexations known as Partitions. Until in 1795, a third and final partition wiped Poland off the map. Now, Polish patriots looked to Napoleon as their saviour, praying that his victories against their occupiers would lead to the rebirth of a Polish state. Marie Walewska became Napoleon's mistress in order to further this cause. Ordinary okay. French soldiers, however, had little love for Poland. It was impoverished, freezing, and they missed home. Desertion rates soared. There were even a hundred cases of suicide. Marshal Ney, commanding 6th Corps, sent patrols towards Heilsberg, looking for better quarters. What they found were Russian and Prussian soldiers on the move. A uh, quick question, was there a penalty for desertion? You get shot if you get caught or something like that? Uh, I feel like that that has a pretty steep penalty usually. They'd stumbled into a surprise winter attack by Bennigsen. Napoleon quickly laid a trap for the Russian army, ordering Ney and Bernadotte to retreat and lure Bennigsen west while he led the rest of the army north to fall on his flank and rear. Yeah. So I'm getting these tasks down. I'm getting them down. But the Russians captured a French courier carrying the Emperor's orders to Marshal Bernadotte. Bennigsen, now warned of the trap, ordered a retreat, fighting a series of rearguard skirmishes against the pursuing French. But he refused to give up the city of Königsberg without a fight, and turned to give battle at Eylau. Okay, so Marshal Ney on the Battle of Eylau says, what a massacre and without any result. Yeah, so it was pretty much was a stalemate, kind of, even though Napoleon, I guess, technically won. It looks like a stalemate pretty much to me. The Battle of Eylau, fought over two days, was one of the most brutal of the Napoleonic Wars, fought in freezing conditions with neither side backing down. Marshal Augereau's 7th Corps, advancing into the face of a snowstorm, lost its way and was cut to pieces by Russian cannon fire. Five French eagles were lost. What's a French eagle? Napoleon's army was only saved by a devastating massed cavalry charge by 10,000 horsemen led by the fearless Marshal Murat, and remembered as one of the great cavalry charges in history. That's what you guys told me At Eylau, for the first time as Emperor, Napoleon failed to win a clear victory on the battlefield. He and the Russians covered up the true scale of their losses, but both sides are estimated to have lost a third of their armies in the carnage. After the horrors of Eylau, both armies sought time to rest and recover. Meanwhile, the newly formed French 10th Corps under Marshal Lefebvre besieged Danzig, held by 13,000 Prussians under General Kalkruth. The city came under heavy French bombardment and infantry assault. After eight weeks, with no prospect of reinforcement, the Prussian garrison surrendered on the 27th of May. Napoleon's northern sea flank was now secure against any possible Russian landing. The French Emperor now commanded an army 190,000 strong, 
against just 115,000 Russian and Prussian troops. But it was Bennigsen who moved first, launching a surprise attack against Ney's 6th Corps on the 5th of June. Ney conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and escaped. Bennigsen, having lost the element of surprise, and with Napoleon advancing, retreated once more. Four days later at Heilsberg, the French lost 10,000 men in a botched assault against Russian defences. But the Russians continued their retreat the next day. Napoleon thought Bennigsen would head north to Königsberg, but instead he retreated northeast, keeping to the east bank of the Aller River. So when Napoleon's army marched north, it was Marshal Land's reserve corps on his right flank that next encountered the Russian army, near the small town of Friedland. Ride your horse into the ground if you have to, but tell the Emperor we're fighting the entire Russian army. Marshal Lands? Man, these horses. <laughs> I'm such an animal lover. I feel bad for these horses. In the late afternoon of the 13th of June, Russian cavalry scouts informed General Bennigsen that they'd found a single French corps at Friedland. Bennigsen decided he had time to cross the Alla River and smash this isolated corps, before the rest of the French army could arrive to save it. And he ordered his army to begin crossing the river. Marshal Lannes, commanding 16,000 men and facing 46,000 Russians, sent an urgent message to Napoleon that he was under attack from the main Russian army. Then he fought a skillful delaying action, hiding the weakness of his force behind a large screen of skirmishers, while gradually yielding ground to the enemy. Quick question, how are they crossing the river at this point? Did they build bridges? Did they use rafts? Did they, I mean, how, how deep was it? Was it shallow enough for them to walk across? Van was still holding off the Russians as darkness fell. That night, Russian engineers built three pontoon bridges at Friedland to speed the movement of troops over the river. Okay, I guess that answers my question. <laughs> How are they but crossing Benningson before the bridge? was taking a huge risk. If this turned into a major battle, his army would have to fight with its back to the river and the steep banks of the mill stream dividing its left wing from its right. Benigsen. I don't understand that. His army was fighting with their backs to the river or would have to. What? If this turned into a major battle, his army would have to fight with its back to the river and the oh. steep banks of the mill stream dividing its left wing from its right. Is that just because they would be backed up into the river at that point and would kind of be, they couldn't retreat very well? Is that what he's talking about? Bennigsen had also badly underestimated the speed at which Napoleon's Grande Armée would react. The first French reinforcements arrived that night. The Emperor himself wasn't far behind. catch the enemy making a mistake like this twice, Napoleon on arriving at Friedland. I'm not sure I understand that quote. I'm assuming he's referring to the Russians, a mistake that they made. What mistake is he talking about? Does he think that the Russians going across the river is a mistake? Maybe we're about to find out. By dawn on the 14th of June, about 40,000 Russians had crossed to the west bank of the Alla River. Bennigsen ordered an attack on the village of Heinrichsdorf to turn the French left flank. But French cavalry reinforcements, led by General Grouchy, intercepted the Russians. 
In more than an hour of charge and counter-charge, the French horsemen finally drove the Russians back. Marshal Mortier's 8th Corps now arrived to reinforce the French centre. In Sortlac Wood, General Oudinot's elite grenadier division fought stubbornly against Prince Bagration's left wing, but was outnumbered by the Russians, and gradually pushed back. Around noon, on a sweltering day, Napoleon himself arrived. So are these guys down here fighting in like a woodland area? Because it looks like it's a foresty type area, if I'm reading this map correctly. I'm assuming that that would require a slightly different fighting style if they were having to maneuver in a forest, but I might not be understanding this correctly, so. He was soon followed by First Corps, commanded by General Victor standing in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte, as well as Ney's 6th Corps and the Imperial Guard under Marshal Bessières. Okay, the Russians are starting to get outnumbered here. The date, the 14th of June, held special significance for Napoleon. It was the seventh anniversary of his great victory over the Austrians at Marengo. A good omen, he declared. The battle then entered a lull, as Napoleon assessed the situation, saw Bennigsen's dangerous position, and issued orders for an attack to take advantage of it. Bennigsen, meanwhile, who was tormented by ill health throughout the day, saw that he now faced the full might of Napoleon's army, and issued orders for a retreat. This is the objective. Advance, looking neither right nor left, bore into this thick mass, cost what it may. I have a feeling this is not going to go well for the Russians. <laughs> but before Bennigsen's retreat could get underway, at 5.30pm, three salvos from the French guns signalled the start of Napoleon's attack. It was led by Ney's 6th Corps on the right wing, who first cleared Bagration's infantry from Sotlak Wood. But as Ney's troops left the cover of the trees, they came under heavy fire from Russian cannon across the river. So they were in the cover of the trees. Interesting. As the French attack faltered, Prince Bagration rallied his men and launched a cavalry counterattack. Ney's corps retreated. But now, General Victor's 1st Corps came up on his left. Its artillery commander, General Senarmont, advanced with 30 guns and blasted the Russians at point-blank range with case shot. Hundreds of Russians were mown down within minutes. I mean... Under this onslaught, Bagration's men began to waver and then retreat. Around 7pm, the Russian Imperial Guard launched a desperate counter-attack to try to halt the French advance on Friedland. But they were outnumbered and outgunned. As exploding shells began to start fires in Friedland, the French centre and left wing joined the attack. Yeah, this is not going With well its for only escape route okay. under threat, the entire Russian army began a panicked retreat towards the river. But Friedland's houses and bridges were now ablaze. The town became a deadly trap for the Russians. Many were drowned trying to cross the river. Others killed or captured. North of how feasible this would have been but in my mind I would have taken some of these guys that were hanging out back here and maybe tried to get them across the river further down or something uh, so that they could basically surround the Russians in case they started to retreat or something like that. You know that's just me and my expert military <laughs> opinion. I don't know it probably wasn't feasible to do that but I don't know I just thought about that. North of Friedland some units were able to escape across a ford or along the river bank but there was no disguising the Russians' terrible defeat. Mm. 
the Battle of Friedland was one of the most decisive victories of Napoleon's career. At the cost of 10,000 casualties, he had inflicted twice as many losses on the Russians, about 20,000 men killed, wounded or taken prisoner, 40% of Bennigsen's army. The Prussians abandoned Königsberg the next day, which was occupied by Soult's 4th Corps, while Russians Bennigsen's shattered ground. army retreated across the river Niemen into Russia. Tsar Alexander's advisers implored him to make peace with Napoleon. He accepted their advice, and a ceasefire was agreed. Not for long, apparently, because apparently Napoleon went to Moscow. Perhaps I was happiest at Tilsit. I found myself victorious, dictating laws, having emperors and kings pay me court. Napoleon in exile in St. Helena. Yeah, I do know he was exiled. Let's tell so though. Maybe we're about to find out. Or I'm about to find out. Alexander and Napoleon met for the first time aboard a raft in the middle of the river Niemen, near Tilsit, and developed an immediate rapport. Tilsit yeah, proved tell. to be one of history's great diplomatic summits as the two emperors fated each other for days, with banquets, parades and concerts, then discussed affairs late into the night. A friendship of sorts developed. While Russia's former ally, King Frederick William of Prussia, was left out in the cold. Uh, I know this is just like a French or European thing, but uh, Napoleon and Alexander I like to hug, a, you know, a lot and, and kiss apparently. So I know this is probably just a political cartoon. And it was Prussia who would lose most in the Treaties of Tilsit, signed two weeks later. One third of Prussian territory was taken away to create the new Kingdom of Westphalia, to be ruled by Napoleon's 22-year-old brother, Jérôme and the Duchy of Warsaw, to be ruled by the King of Saxony, which Polish patriots hoped would prove a stepping stone on the road to their own state. Polish troops were recruited into the Grande Armée, with Polish lancers even forming part of Napoleon's elite Imperial Guard. Russia only had to give up the Ionian Islands. As Alexander accepted an alliance with Napoleon, that left the French Emperor master of Europe. Alexander even agreed to join the Continental System, Napoleon's economic blockade of Great Britain, which banned <laughs> British ships and goods from all French-controlled ports. Wow. The system had been established the previous winter by Napoleon's Berlin Decree. Napoleon hoped that by cutting off British trade with Europe, He'd cause financial chaos and political upheaval in Britain, allowing him to make a favourable peace. There was just... Is this maybe why Britain sought trade with other countries around the world at this point? Like in India, I know that they were doing some trade with the United States at that point as well. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. Just one problem. The continental system didn't work. Hmm. Maybe. Not only was it impossible to enforce and undermined by widespread smuggling, the system damaged French trade just as much as British trade. So maybe Britain wasn't really The decisive by it, weapon in this economic war would prove to be the British Royal Navy, which that summer ensured its continued naval dominance by launching a preemptive strike against the neutral Danish fleet at Copenhagen, capturing their warships before they could fall into Napoleon's hands. Royal Navy squadrons blockaded all major French ports, seizing any ships trading with France, while ensuring British merchants could continue to trade overseas in relative safety. Okay. The Navy even seized the tiny Danish island of Heligoland as a base for smuggling British goods into Europe. But most disastrously for Napoleon, the continental system would draw him into two conflicts, 
that proved ruinous for his empire. The first would be fought in the Iberian Peninsula, where Napoleon decided to force Britain's ally, Portugal, to join the continental system. In November 1807, French troops, supported by their Spanish ally, invaded the country. The Portuguese royal family fled to their colony of Brazil, as the French occupied Lisbon without a fight. It looked as though Napoleon had won yet another easy victory. But the Peninsular War was just beginning. I've heard of this. Heard of this, so... Okay, so there we have Friedland. Big important battle for Napoleon, a horrible defeat for the Russians. But it looks like Russia and Napoleon are on pretty good terms at this point. Obviously that goes downhill at some point. <laughs> I don't know if it's because Alexander I is out of power and somebody new comes in who doesn't really get along with Napoleon, but I'm gonna find out as we go with these videos. And yeah, also if you're gonna establish a continental system, I guess you better make sure your navy is superior to Britain's navy, which obviously it wasn't. So I guess that was one of Napoleon's weaknesses, was that his navy just wasn't up to par with that of Britain's, which kind of limited what he could do. So I do see how Britain is kind of keeping him in check at this point, even though they're not really in the war on the land from what I'm seeing. I mean, the only battle I remember watching so far with the British on land with Napoleon was the battle at Toulon or the siege of Toulon. But other than that, it looks like they're mostly fighting him with their navy. But it's really interesting to me how things are kind of shaping up here in Europe. It looks very different from the map of Europe that I'm used to seeing. Uh, Prussia looks like it's about to go away. It looks like it's about to get wiped off the map. We see maybe the beginnings of Poland here as well. But I am really, really enjoying learning more about the history of Europe and kind of seeing how it was and how it kind of came to be as we know it today. It's just kind of mind-boggling when you think about all of the stuff that went on in the past in the world that you're completely unaware of. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts about history. I just feel like that there's something unexpected around every corner. So if any of you can answer my questions in the comments below or if you want to add something to the discussion, please do. Also, make sure if you enjoyed this video to like and subscribe. We're going to be moving on with the rest of the Napoleonic Wars. We're we're also going to be exploring some other things here or there as well, so make sure you stay tuned for all of that, and Roger and I will see you next time.